Can you guys hear me okay? Hey, um, my name is Rachel Simone Weil. I'm a graduate design MFA candidate at the University of Texas, and thank you guys so much for having me today. Um, so, um, I've been really interested in uh, video game nostalgia and history. It seems to factor so greatly in game culture today, whether in academic writing, game collecting practices, and notably in the indie game scene and the popularity of pixel art and retro aesthetics. Um, so for the next few minutes, I'd talk, like to talk a little bit about um, some of my thoughts about video game nostalgia and history that comes out of my thesis work on retro game culture and nostalgia for mainstream commercial girlhood in the 80s and 90s. Um, I'd also like to, at the end, offer some alternative methods for working through game nostalgia with examples from my own practice, not, not as an advertisement, but just kind of as a real world example of um, how we can use some of these alternative methods. Um, I don't see this as like a complete theory or even a manifesto, um, but maybe just one point on a spectrum. I think there are some things I'm going to say that you could certainly disagree with. Um, so use what's helpful and discard what's not. Um, in her essay, Nostalgia and Its Discontents, Svetlana Boim writes, it is up to us to take responsibility for our nostalgia and not let others prefabricate it for us. The prepackaged usable past may be of no use to us if we want to co-create our future. Um, this quote really resonated with me and I found it incredibly applicable to video game nostalgia and the communities that engage with it. And in particular, I had been concerned over um, you know, the past year or two that video game history and video game nostalgia had been kind of bleeding into one another, or those lines had been blurring. And I was interested in, in the sort of ramifications of that. So I feel like video game nostalgia could be described as prepackaged. Um, of course, we see things like 8-bit um, sort of pixel art and typefaces in the Space Invaders um, graphic. And it, you know, this is Space Invaders is a game that came out before I was born, and I, honestly, I've only played it once or twice. But um, e even though I shouldn't really feel nostalgic for this game, somehow I do, uh, <laughs> right? I see it emblazoned on uh, the headers of game blogs and on hoodies and book covers about video game history and energy drinks. And um, I don't know, maybe it's just because I, I feel some sort of peer pressure, um, but I have, you know, certainly Space Invaders is historically significant, um, but I feel like for me, my reverence has fallen into sort of a false nostalgia for this game. Um, I think that game criticism, especially criticism outside of, uh, or criticism that focuses on mainstream industry practices, um, could really benefit from dissecting this prepackaged past and what messages it transmits. Um, so, you know, there's nothing terribly wrong with being nostalgic for old video games. There's certainly games that I'm nostalgic for. But I'd like to point out four areas that I've been thinking about lately with regard to um, prepackaged nostalgia for 20th century games. The first of these is that uh, prepackaged nostalgia is flat, right? And it requires a certain homogeny while discarding non-conforming histories. So, you know, the Space Invaders icon and Super Mario Brothers typeface and the one-up mushroom, all these things, they serve as these visual stand-ins uh, for game nostalgia while games that don't fit closely enough with this visual language. Um, I'm thinking of LCD handheld games, for example. Um, they, they can't be incorporated into this easily digestible prepackaged past that we can readily consume and then we can also readily build off of and create new games. Um, and so if you think about postmodern critiques, Lyotard, Foucault, um, you might imagine that the homogeny of nostalgia may serve to re -ex uh, reinforce existing narratives and hierarchies. Uh, secondly, because nostalgia is emotional, I think prepackaged nostalgia and history can strengthen our emotional allegiance to the gaming canon, which can in turn impair our ability to um, create nuanced criticism of these games, right? Like, it's incredibly hard to stand up and say, uh, Space Invaders sucks, right? Like, that's not something that I would feel comfortable saying. Of course, it's an important game, but um, there's, there's also this emotional aspect to it that I think makes it really difficult. Um, and interestingly, it can be even harder to say Space Invaders sucks if due to our identity as a critic, for example, maybe that's uh, gender or racial identity, our perceived knowledge is already suspect. <laughs> Um, and so, for me, the, a false nostalgia for space invaders or a defense of space invaders may be a way for me to gain cultural currency in a critical field where I feel maybe my knowledge is suspect because I'm, I'm a woman. 
Thirdly, prepackaged nostalgia can patrol the borders of who's considered to be a real gamer or a legit legitimate gamer. So in this case, um, you know, when we use 8-bit typography on, on our websites, it, it in a way it functions as a reference or, or maybe even a litmus test, an indicator of game literacy, a way to say like, oh, you, you understand where I'm going with this reference, okay, like you're cool, you can come in. Um, and unfortunately, this serves to reproduce a certain kind of community. Um, for, and, and so, for example, you never had access to arcades, as I didn't as a kid, um, due to institutional or cultural barriers. Maybe um, your parents thought it wasn't safe for you to go to the arcade. Um, you understandably might not connect with these games. And so even 20 or 30 years after arcade culture has pretty much come and gone, these barriers for entry into game culture are reinscribed. And finally, my fourth argument here is that in general, longing for the past, I think it means something. And we should, we should dissect what that meaning is. What I, what I am concerned about is that longing for old video games may serve as an implied rejection of the way that contemporary critics and players have problematized games and game culture. So many of the people that have talked today are concerned about um, you know, representation, political issues, uh, racism, industry practices, all these things, and, and I feel like in a way, nostalgia and contemporary reimaginings of old video games are a way to deflect anxiety around these critiques. It's a way of saying, like, I don't, I don't want to deal with sexism and racism. Like, I just want to play games, right? This is a time when, in the 80s, back when games were just about fun and they were simple. And I think that's a really interesting kind of defense and something that's worth dissecting. So um, I think these four points could be perhaps summarized in this way. Nostalgia defers perceived responsibility. And I want to stress that this is totally understandable. Um, I'm not saying game nostalgia is bad or pixel art is bad or anything like that. Um, but, you know, how do, how do we navigate this? People have legitimate feelings. How, how do we deal with this, um, these concerns about game nostalgia? Um, and you know, I think sometimes critical intervention isn't received well by the gaming community at large because it can feel like someone's coming in and saying like, okay, I'm gonna take all your toys and round them up one by one and put them in a fire and you're gonna watch them burn. Um, <laughs> and that's not a good feeling. So you can really see there, there are a lot of different perspectives on this issue. So my question is, um, yeah, of course it's complicated and that's okay. How do we reconcile these differences and craft compassionate, effective, critical interventions um, that deal with these problems? And so I'd like to share three methods that I've used in my own work. Again, um, mine deals with 80s and 90s commercial mainstream girlhood, but I think that um, these methods might be useful in whatever area that you're interested in. And they, and they focus on adding to game history and game nostalgia rather than kind of tearing it down. So the first is to remember your memories. I know that, that sounds kind of obvious, but, um, but I, I would encourage you to ask, or ask yourself what games you personally are nostalgic for. If it's Barbie fashion designer, roll with that, right? Like use that to inspire your written works, your, um, your criticism, and the games that you develop. And in so doing, you'll fracture the homogeny of mainstream game culture. Um, and one way that I've done this in my own work is in creating Femicom, which is the feminine computer museum. So I document girly pink games from the 80s and 90s um, through gameplay videos and screenshots and, and things like that, interviews, because I felt these games weren't reflected in retro game culture. You don't see these kinds of images on hoodies. Um, and they also weren't being documented or valued by mainstream archives and collections. <laughs> My second method is to create false histories where no suitable ones exist. Uh, this is kind of the rebellious side of me that says, you know what, if game history doesn't give a fuck about me, I don't give a fuck about it. Um, and so uh, under the alias Party Time Hexalent, uh, I've been making these super ultra hyper feminine NES games, and they're authentic in the sense that they run on a real NES console. Um, I'm really interested in creating like box art that says made in 1992 and just kind of messing with history, and I think this is kind of an, another postmodern um, method, this idea of subverting the conventions of mainstream histories and playing at the borders of fact and fiction. 
And um, my third point, just to wrap up, is to balance rebellion and reconciliation. I think rebellion is an important critical practice, but I want to give a shout out to reconciliatory methods as well. Woo, reconciliation. <laughs> I think this is, you know, what drives us as, as people is a desire to connect to others and feel some kind of fellowship. So. Um, this is an advertisement from a 19, 1980s magazine for floppy disks, and I absolutely love the ad because uh, the slogan is no bad memories. And aside from this being a pun about data corruption, it's a reconciliatory message, right? No bad memories, no shameful pasts, no hard feelings, no single correct path. Um, so I felt compelled to co-opt the slogan for myself. And that being said, you can find me at nobadmemories.com. Uh, thanks so much. There's some more contact info for me, and thanks again for having me.